So we have a collection of objects in front of us. We have some blue squares, we have some green circles and we have some yellow circles. And let's say I'm interested in these blue squares. I want to study them closely. I want to know whether they interact with each other and how they interact with the other shapes. So what if I group them by just drawing a boundary around these squares? So by doing this, what I've done is I have separated out the portion that I want to study. And now I can think of this collection, which is within the boundary as a system of objects that I want to study. So within this is the system. This circle here is the boundary and everything outside this boundary is let's say what we call surroundings. So what I've done is I've made it a bit easier to describe this configuration. So this helps set context. So let's say you walk up to your friends and you want to discuss some thermodynamics with them, as one does of course. You want to be able to easily communicate what is it that you're interested in. And as soon as you define a boundary, you separate the part of your interest, which is the system, from whatever is not included in the system, that is the surroundings. And again, this choice of boundary is arbitrary. So if I say something like my system has yellow circles, I can draw a boundary around this and everything within this becomes my system and everything else which is outside this becomes my surroundings. So if we go back to our original example, which was the system of blue squares, there are some questions that I can ask about this boundary. Can any one of the circles enter this system or can one of the squares exit this system? And what if maybe they can't go in or go out physically? But there is some exchange of energy at this boundary. Like if you pick up a glass of hot milk, your hands are touching the glass and not the hot milk directly, but still you feel the heat. So if these blue squares are at a higher temperature and all of the circles are at a lower temperature, will there be an energy transfer at this boundary? So to answer these questions, we can build on top of this idea and classify systems based on how they interact with their surroundings. Let's see how that is done. So to study the interactions between systems and surroundings, Let's take this bottle with some water in it. So in the example we saw before, the boundary was imaginary and arbitrary. Here, let's take the boundary to be the outside surface of this bottle. So in this case, the boundary is a real physical boundary. And what we are interested in is across this boundary, whether matter or energy can be exchanged. So in case of this bottle, now because it is an open bottle, you can add more water into it or you can remove some water from this. So we know that in this case, matter can be added or removed and so an exchange of matter is possible across the boundary and similarly if we think of the exchange of energy so if this water was at a higher temperature just by touching the surface outside because of the energy transfer you would realize that the water is hot which is why in this case an energy exchange is also possible so such a system which allows for the addition or removal of matter or for the exchange of energy with its surroundings is called an open system but now what if i cap this bottle and now what I've done is I've closed this bottle. So after this, I cannot add more water into it and I cannot take out water from this. So in that case, I've prevented the exchange of matter across the boundary. But still, if the water is hot or cold, the outer surface of the bottle will also be hot or cold. And so even by capping the bottle, although there is no exchange of matter, there is exchange of energy across the boundary and such a system is called a closed system. But what if I want to prevent the exchange of matter and energy? So let's say what I do is I coat this bottle or the surface of the bottle with some insulating material. And now what I'm doing is because of this insulation, I'm making sure that the energy transfer across this boundary is also stopped. So what is happening in this case is that there is no transfer of matter, nor there is a transfer of energy. And such a system is called an isolated system. So you can see that how based on whether matter or energy can be exchanged, we can classify the systems as open, closed or isolated. But I want to bring out a point here. To make the system isolated, we assume that we are coating this bottle in some material. But usually in real life, we would never find examples like this. And so the point here is that isolated systems are a hypothetical construct. They sometimes help us simplify our calculations or remove some complicated external effects. And we can get good approximations, which are useful. And there's one more thing here. So it's easy to identify whether there has been an exchange of matter. Like for example, when this bottle was not closed, we could easily see how this would be an open system because we could add water into this bottle or, or take out water from it. But sometimes when we look at the exchange of energy, it can get tricky. So let's take another example and see this in detail. Sometimes when you're trying to identify whether a system is open or closed or isolated, things may get tricky. 
Let's go through one example and try to understand this better. Earlier we had seen the system of a bottle with some water in it. But now let us look at this system, which is slightly more complicated looking. Let me just take you through all the parts of this system. So here there is a block and this block is closing off this container, which has some gas inside. And you can see that I've drawn these gas molecules and we know that they're randomly moving about within this box. But the way I have set up this container is that I can push on this block to move it inwards. And we'll assume that there is no friction along these walls. So although the block is still now at this moment, we are going to assume that we can push the block from here and it can move downwards. And also inside this chamber, along all these walls, let's assume that we have coated them with some insulating material. And what this does is this insulates all the walls of this chamber. So what we're saying is heat cannot be transferred in or transferred out via these boundaries. Or another way to say the same thing is that this wall or this boundary is adiabatic. So there is no heat coming in or heat going out. So this is the setup. Now what we want to find out here is what type of system is this? Is this an open system or a closed system or an isolated system? So to check that we will look at two things whether the exchange of matter is possible and whether the exchange of energy is possible. So first let's look at matter. Now because this block is placed here and all of the gas is contained within this chamber, gas cannot escape from this or more gas cannot be introduced into the chamber. And so for this system, matter exchange is definitely not possible. So we know that this cannot be an open system because if matter exchange was allowed, it would be an open system. So now let's look at energy. So we know that this boundary inside the chamber is adiabatic which means there will be no transfer of heat across this boundary. So if we know that there will be no heat transfer across this boundary, can we also say that there will be no energy transfer across this boundary? Let's think about this. Now we know that this block can be pushed. So what if we push this block downwards? So when we push this block, a part of that mechanical energy went into moving this block downwards and a part of it also got transferred to the gas molecules because we see that the kinetic energy of the molecules has increased and they start moving faster. So that means even when there was no transfer of heat possible across this boundary, energy transfer was still possible. And so because we cannot exchange matter, but energy can be exchanged, we know that this setup is a closed system. And the important point I want you to remember from this exercise is that whenever you're checking for energy transfer, you should check for energy transfer across all forms, including heat and mechanical work.